Welcome to the South African Civil Society Information Service. I'm Fazila Farouk in Johannesburg. Just last week, President Obama visited the Middle East on a four-day trip, which included visits to Israel, Palestine, as well as Jordan. Obama has been criticized for not calling for a halt to settlement e expansion in occupied Palestine. The trip generally has been regarded as something as a failure because he also didn't put any pressure on the Israeli authorities to jumpstart negotiations towards a resolution of the now 45-year-old military occupation of Palestine. Interestingly enough also, um, having just returned a few days ago, from the Middle East. We have with us in the studio today University of Johannesburg academic Salim Valley. Salim was in the Middle East also attempting to visit Palestine but wound up spending um, a significant number of days in Jordan because he was actually stopped at the Palestinian border, interrogated by Israeli soldiers for up to five hours and searched. Welcome to Saxus Salim. Thank you, Fazila. It's unfortunate that you're here to talk about such an awful experience. But tell us, what happened exactly? You were trying to enter Palestine. You were invited by the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. You weren't able to make it through. Yes, I mean, uh, in a nutshell, that's what happened. Of course, the reception I received was markedly different from the one Obama received, uh, to say the least. Uh, but uh, I have a long-standing arrangement with uh, colleagues throughout the world. I'm involved in comparative uh, international education. So primarily through the Frederick Ebert Stiftung, uh, which is, you know, I think the second biggest foundation, if not the f biggest in, in, in Germany, uh, and they have an office in Jerusalem. Um, through their ages, they invited me to meet with their partners, but also to talk about education generally. And uh, I'm, the highlight of this was meant to be a keynote address at Biruzet University, which has a, a long history uh, in Palestine. So tell us what happened at the border. Tell us about your experience of being stopped and interrogated, how long it took, uh, what kind of questions were put to you, and how that whole experience was. Sure. I mean, first, firstly, um, to be honest, this was a long shot. Uh, the fact that I was not allowed to enter was not unexpected. There were people who, who, who've been attempting to go over the past few years, and in some cases, my name uh, came up during the interrogation. Um, so uh, there was always a chance that I would not be allowed in. And I deliberately went via Jordan, the Allenby Bridge, because if you fly in, you are deported, put on the next flight back to wherever you came from. But in this case, I was deported across the border. Um, when I got in, I mean, I, I, you know, deliberately was very conscious about my surroundings because I thought this would end with the interrogation and sent back. I knew, I knew that was always a very big possibility. Um, and it was quite fascinating for me for a number of reasons. First of all, I reflected on the stories I heard from people who went through the interrogation. Secondly, you know, I reflected on our own experience. I was in prison a number of times in South Africa. Uh, so were my close relatives, my brother, friends. And I was involved in the black consciousness movement. So I, uh, you know, it was in a sense uh, a comparative look at this as well. So things like the buses coming in, largely religious pilgrims, Christian and uh, Muslim uh, was quite interesting for me. So that when I was there in the period, there was a busload of Brazilians, for example, and then a busload of Bangladeshis with religious garb on and the differential treatment of these pilgrims. Uh, but thirdly, the Palestinian families who were coming um, in conversation with them um, I deduce that many of them were visiting for a short period of time their families in the diaspora 
in neighboring countries, uh, refugees. But also a large number of them, particularly young men, were coming back as migrant workers, uh, largely in the Gulf states. So I observed this and how people were treated. I was... Um, and what was their treatment like? Well, uh, you know, on the scale of differential uh, treatment, uh, the Christian pilgrims were treated most gently. Uh, the Muslim religious pilgrims were treated um, in a more harsher way, uh, but uh, particular uh, harshness, I would say, you know, casual brutality was reserved for Palestinians. In my case, so I went to the counter like everybody else, and it was quite clear that I was not identified. In other words, they weren't waiting for me. Uh, the questions posed were, what am I doing there? I showed them the letter. The first, the second question was, are you going to Ramallah, which is in the occupied uh, West Bank? Um, and then uh, I needed to step aside. I was also asked whether I spoke Arabic and whether I'm Palestinian. And then I was asked to step aside. I waited for another hour. And that's the whole thing. People have to wait. And it's a process. It's like taken through a mill. Um, so you wait and um, your passport is taken. And I, I guess that's when I was identified because six uh, young men, uh, Israelis, came to me in a very aggressive manner and took me to a curtained off area which is uh, quite surreal because five meters from there there are people coming in in an ordinary way and being searched through the x-ray machines but I was then asked to strip to my briefs um, initially emptied my pockets, uh, searched my clothes and then asked to strip. Um, that took a good 15 minutes. I was then motioned in a very violent way to take a seat. And then I had to wait again. And then uh, a similar process, but this time summoned uh, to identify my bag um, and the contents of my bag uh, taken out. I was then asked to sit aside in a way where I couldn't see what was happening with my bag, uh, but I was quite uh, anxious about that. And I peered uh, from a distance and I could see vaguely that everything was gone through in a very thorough manner. Uh, the, some of the books I had, including travel books, uh, you know, was was shaken and pages looked through, the seams of my clothes, my, my toothpaste was taken out. I had some nuts and uh, dried fruit, uh, like a good South African, <laughs> expecting to be there for a few good hours. Uh, that was emptied um, on a metal uh, table. Um, but, you know, my bag and what happened to its contents was not unique. This is what happened to Palest what was happening to the Palestinian families as well. And they were really anxious about it. They kept looking at their gifts, etc. And this took uh, another half hour. I was then told to wait another hour. And increasingly the rooms then become smaller. And then eventually I was taken to a corridor. Um, very narrow, uh, small, without any ventilation. And I saw seven young men, Palestinians there. And they explained to me that they were there, they, that they were there for two hours. One of the persons was asthmatic, had difficulty breathing. Uh, I was the first one taken away. I'm not sure how long they were kept there into a small room. And I was interrogated by uh, a woman whose um, attitude was uh, markedly different from the previous people who handled me. Um, and she referred to me as Dr. Valley and uh, are you okay? Have you been treated okay? And of course I said no, I'm quite shocked at the treatment and uh, 
she said, okay, don't worry, I'll see to this. I was about to roll my eyes, but <laughs> the purpose was for me to be allowed in. So it uh, required a lot of self-discipline on my part. The, the questions were largely facile and inane. Um, you know, everything from my siblings to my parents, grandparents and great-grandparents, trying to establish a link whether I come from that part of the world, uh, whether I'm genuinely South African, whether I speak Arabic, uh, what do I do at work, whether I've been to Palestine previously, um, and that kind of um, uh, issues. Um, uh, there were a few pointed questions. Um, um, I'm not sure if a Google search was done on my name, but then after about half an hour, I was told to take a seat again. Another hour went past and uh, a young man came to me, marched up to me and said, I'm a security risk and that I've been denied entry. So you end up waiting for another hour and a half. I've left out some details but the tediousness, but also the different kinds of relations with the Israelis there, um, it's all a formula and it's not something unique to me, it's what other people have gone through as well. Let's change tack a little bit and talk about your views on Obama's trip um, to the Middle East in, uh, in the past few days, last week. <clears throat> what do you make of uh, the positions he advanced um, and the fact that he took such a soft stance when um, engaging with the Israelis on the issue of the Palestinian occupation? Well, really disastrous. Um, he basically swallowed all the myths and the propaganda uh, ideologically of Zionism when he landed he talked about this being a Jewish homeland uh, and this is not factual it's absolutely not factual um, you know this is the homeland of people who lived there some of whom were Jews uh, many of whom were descendants of the present-day Palestinians uh, it's a myth to say that it's a Jewish homeland. By saying that as well, even in terms of today's Israel, you're excluding 20% of the population who are Arab, Muslim and Christian Palestinians or, or, or non-believing Palestinians, you know, basically. Um, you, you also, he also said very little about the settlements uh, relative to what he said previously. The whole question of peace talks, I mean, this is really a red herring. Uh, Israel talks about peace uh, very well, expertly, <laughs> but they wage war. They take more and more Palestinian land. The question of the two-state solution as well, uh, it's going to be a parody of a state. It's a facade at best a Bantustan. So what do you think then are the prospects for a resolution to the situation? Do you think there's any possibility that we'll somehow get to the point where there's an end to this 45 year old military occupation of Palestine and what kind of solution do you see manifesting? Well relative to say 10 years ago the balance of power in favour of those who are calling for genuine change for a democratic uh, dinome, uh, a one-state solution where all uh, Jews and Arabs, Muslims and Christian atheists have equal rights as a minimum. Okay, I believe one needs to go beyond that in terms of the economic structure, etc. But th that kind of democratic solution, those who are calling for that, is changing rapidly. That around the world. People are not taken in by the canards and the calumnies any longer. Uh, the, the charge of being anti-Semitic, if you are critical of Israel, doesn't hold much water any longer. Um, the, the terrible use of that tragedy of, for humankind, the Holocaust, cannot be used as a justification any longer. So this is changing and there are movements of people throughout the world, all corners of the world, who are taking up 
uh, the issue of solidarity with the Palestinian people. So the tide is turning. It's going to be difficult. There are many other factors which makes it more complicated than our struggle. But nonetheless, you know, to paraphrase that uh, uh, cliche that, um, you know, change seems impossible until it becomes inevitable. Uh, you know, when people talking about the revolutions in the North Africa and the Arab world, uh, many of these countries, when you talk to activists there, <laughs> they never expected the kind of mass uprisings to occur uh, as they did. Uh, once fear is broken, uh, people speak to their destiny. Um, and I think that um, there are times when there are extreme low points where you think there's not going to be change. It's something we experience in this country in the mid-80s, for example. I don't think there's been fundamental change in our country at all, um, but I think uh, we shouldn't trivialize the changes that have been made. Um, so I think uh, uh, it's important for us to bear that in mind. It should not paralyze us, the odds we are up against. We need to be realistic, of course, but we can be strategic and creative despite the odds stacked against us. Sunny Belly, thank you very much for joining us at SACSIS and thank you very much for joining us at the South African Civil Society Information Service.